Um, so in Ireland we're quite unique, we're one of the few places in the world where we still do motorsport on closed private roads. Um, so whenever we race motorbikes back home, uh, we do it on the highways and byways. And you can see from this picture of me at Armoy, um, there's not an awful lot of room there. There's a lot of spectators in the background. Uh, this is about 165 miles an hour. Uh, we're jumping about three feet in the air. Um, and the guys that are really fast are much faster than I'm going over this. So if Twitter's taught me one thing over the last year, it's that anaesthetists are fairly boring individuals. They sit in theatre, uh, they give propofol and they put laryngeal masks in and they read the paper. Um, well, I'd invite anybody to come and sit in my office with me at the weekends and we could see how exciting anaesthetists can be. So um, the road racing scene's quite unique. The circuits are maybe seven to nine miles long. Um, the infrastructure isn't great. You can see they're mostly hedge-lined. Um, they're public roads and they're small roads. So they're slightly too, uh, too short for a helicopter to be useful. They're slightly too long to have a series of ambulances and medical cars. So one of our strategies is to use rapid response motorcycles like, like I ride, um, and they cut the circuit down quite quickly. You can be on scene very fast. So this is one of the strangest conflict of interest slides you're ever likely to see. Um, <clears throat> so I'm sponsored by Denise Leathers, RI Helmets, Daytona Boots, Bridgestone Tires, and Modal Oil. So <laughs> uh, if you don't use any of these products, you'll almost certainly die. <laughs> So, uh, so this is our team. It's not just a one-man band. We do have fully stocked medical cars, um, paramedics, other doctors, but the first response in our environment is by fast response bike. So this is me on my fast response bike. This is me talking to Michael Dunlop, who's a multiple TT winner. Um, he's one of the most normal individuals you'd ever find when you're speaking to him one-to-one. -one. Uh, this is Michael Dunlop minutes later, um, and this sure gives you some impression of the environment that we race in. Um, this is the Southern 100. Uh, this is probably about 155 miles an hour. There's a stone wall about maybe two feet away from Michael's head, and he's in a group of bikes all trying to get past each other. Um, so these guys aren't, aren't seeing. The speeds are incredible. Um, this is the Northwest 200. Somewhere like the Northwest, the Isle of Man TT, the Ulster Grand Prix, the average speeds are now in excess of 130 miles an hour. That's an average speed. Maximum speeds in excess of 200 miles an hour. So whenever these guys crash, they crash big. Um, and whenever they come off their bikes, they travel at an enormous speed. They can be very lucky and they can be very unlucky in their crashes. So really what I'm going to try and do today is take you through some of the cases that we've seen, um, some of the learning points there off in this very unique environment. Um, so first of all, uh, this case was actually from a short circuit, so it's not a road race at all. Um, but it's to give you some idea of the, um, the acuity. My microphone just died. Okay, so it gives you some idea of the acuity that we work in, and this is quite unique for us. Um, so even the best helicopter service in the world, there's still a lag of a few minutes before they can get to patients. Sometimes we see patients um, within the first seconds of the dying process, and this is just one such chap. So to orientate yourself, this is looking down the start-finish straight out of the last corner. Um, this chap came powering out of the last corner uh, down the start-finish straight, and we saw him coming, um, and this was a practice session. So he came out 80 miles an hour, 90, 100, 110, 120, still accelerating. You could hear him kicking up the gearbox in the bike. And as he came onto the start-finish straight, he started looking down the side of the bike, and he started working at something down the side, and he was adjusting a transponder as he was coming down the start-finish. And it was a bit like someone changing a CD in the car in the motorway. He slowly started drifting, and we, we were sat on the other side of this wall, and we could see it coming, and we thought, oh, surely not. But yes, he rode straight into the end of the pit wall um, at about 130 miles an hour. And you can see from sort of the size of some of the stones that he's ripped out there, this was a massive, massive accident. Um, so... We were on scene really within 10 seconds of this guy's impact, and he was dead. He was in traumatic cardiac arrest. Um, we got the race stopped. Um, and like most services, we have a very structured, rapid approach to traumatic cardiac arrest. Um, so there's no CPR, uh, no clear fluids, no IV access. You get a tube, bilateral thoracostomies, a pelvic binder on quite rapidly, and then a reassessment. And with those three interventions, he had an output back. Um, so very, very rapid bilateral chest decompressions, two lungs down, dreadful maxillofacial injuries. Um, but he got an output back. He was then anaesthetized and transferred to the most appropriate hospital, as is our want in the pre-hospital environment. But you can see from the sort of level of devastation, this guy decelerated from well over 120 miles an hour within a couple of feet. He just hit that wall and stopped dead. And um, it's sort of a reflection on how a structured approach within the early stages of the dying process in traumatic injury can have a good outcome. This guy's now back running his own business. But you can see the sort of devastation that caused. So racing is dangerous. Uh, this is me. I know racing is dangerous. I have been that man. Um, I have lots of metal work, I've been in hospital lots of time, I've had lots of operations, and I still don't learn. So all these are me. 
One of the principal things about racing on the roads is the furniture, and it's the stuff that's lying about that's dangerous. This is Michael Dunlop again, um, and you can see how close he's coming to that stone wall. Uh, this is again in excess of 100 miles an hour, wheeling, leant over, looking up the road, and brushing a stone wall with your shoulder. But you can see someone's taped a straw bale to this stone wall, so that's fine. That's safe <laughs> enough. That's legit. So the speed and the environment that you race in is the problem. This is Martin Finnegan, and this is again uh, a notorious section of track at the circuit called the Tandergee 100. Uh, this is also 160 miles an hour flying through the air. Um, it's a dreadfully cruel sport. Um, literally about two corners after this was taken, uh, Martin Finnegan was dead. Um, he overshot a corner, um, hit this grass bank, and he died. So it's a fantastic sport. It's also a very cruel sport. So a couple of things I'm going to talk about. First of all, beware of fire. We always start talking about scene safety when we're pre-hospitalists, and there's a few ways that bikes can burn. They can burn instantly. They can burn after a couple of minutes. Uh, there can be a mist burn where you get some petrol leaking, and then someone moves the bike, and up she goes. Um, and a quick shifter as well is a device that cuts the ignition, and this can sometimes cause problems when you go to move a motorcycle. So this is an instant burn. This is a bike that's hit and has exploded the petrol tank, and up she goes. Uh, so it's very straightforward. This is quite an obvious one. This is a delayed burn. This is a bike that's fallen over and has been leaking petrol. And the marshals have gone to lift the bike. And as they've done that, the petrol has poured onto the hot um, exhaust and it's burst into flames. But you can see they're dealing with it in a fairly controlled and calm way. Uh, <coughs> this is the uh, every man for himself approach to <laughs> And you would expect that this guy here, if he had the chance, he'd be throwing women and children behind him to try and burst the flames. But <laughs> Uh, so this is a buddy of mine, this is Guy Martin, and this is us racing in Germany, racing go-karts actually is a matter of interest. You can see guys there in the first step of the podium, and there in the second step of the podium. The angry looking man on the phone is actually the European go-kart champion at the time. <laughs> he got fairly roughed up during this. But Guy had a very impressive crash at the TT races this year. Um, he crashed with a full fuel load. The pedal tanks on these bikes, these super bikes, are full of aviation fuel, so they're maybe carrying 20 litres of the highest octane race fuel you could imagine. And if you look high up in the photo, you can see the pedal tank flying through the air, up there. If you look low in the photo, you can see Guy Martin. There's his leg. So if you look down low, you can see Guy's leg coming out of the fireball. Uh, this was a big crash. This was an, an enormous crash. Uh, there's what's left of the bike. And Guy was fine. He was grand. I um, mean, a couple of fractured vertebrae, pneumothorax. That's fine for a racer. Let's get away that. <laughs> so this is another example of a bike burning. This is me standing about um, at a road race in the south of Ireland. And we do an awful lot of standing about, waiting for things to happen. Um, there was an incident that occurred. The red flags went out. Uh, so we all mobilized, and off we went. So the rapid response bikes took off, and we headed off to scene. Um, this is what we were met with, a fairly standard pre-hospital scene. You roll up, and with motorcycles, the first thing you do is count the number of patients, count the number of bikes, and see if they match. Because if you have more bikes than you have patients, someone's missing. They're either in, uh, under a hedge, or uh, they're somewhere where you don't expect them. So we had one bike, one patient. This is the patient. Um, on first assessment, he was fine. He was talking. Um, he, was, he was grand to all intents and purposes. Um, but there was an enormous amount of activity happening in the garden that you can see in the background. There was an awful lot of flapping and shouting and panicking going on. So we did a quick assessment of this guy. He was fine. We split the team, and some of us went up into the garden to see what the hell was happening up in there. What we were met with was we found a bike. Um, it had made its way up onto this fence. Um, unfortunately, there was a group of people leaning on this fence watching the races. Um, if you're a fan of motorsport or motorcycles, you'll notice that the petrol tank is missing from this bike, and this was the first lap of the race. So essentially, this bike had left the track, it was a big tank full of 20 litres of high-octane aviation fuel strapped to the top of it. It hit this fence where there was a lot of people enjoying a beer um, and exploded. So we found the petrol tank just over the side of the fence. It was still on fire, hence the fire extinguisher. So we had to go looking for the patients then. The first thing we did was put out the fire. Very important. Um, oxygen is supposed to be the first point of contact for critical illness, not if the person's on fire, it isn't. <laughs> so. so we then found the patient. We found an elderly gentleman on fire, uh, lying in the middle of the garden. Um, so the first thing we did we, was we put him out, and there's a bit of a flurry of activity going on here where we got ourselves together. We were then able to assess the patient. This man was wearing a jumper when he was leaning against the, face, the fence. You can see it's exploded and burnt off him. You can see his trousers have been burnt. Um, he's a bit combative. Uh, his airway was rapidly being lost in front of, front of us. His face was visibly swelling, because this is high-octane octane race fuel. This is my concerned face. <laughs> it's important to have a concerned face. But your concerned face should never change, regardless of the situation that you're in. So even if you're faced with a dreadful airway in the pre-hospital environment, 
Your concern face should be no more severe than if you're taking the fairing off a bike working in a workshop, because you have to bring some element of calm and control to these situations. They're not good ones. There's nothing to be gained by panicking and flapping about. So we know what this man needs. He needs an RSI. We've got a system to do that. We've got a team that can deliver it. So there's no need for concern here. So I told myself. Um, so again, like any structured pre-hospital service, we've got a way of doing this. We get our equipment together. We've got suction, oxygen. Uh, we've got expert help at our right-hand side. Uh, we haven't rushed in. We're going through our checklist. We're checking our equipment. And this guy was tricky. You can see the amount of equipment that starts to build up when you're delivering a pre-hospital RSI. It shouldn't be done in a hurry. It should be done in a controlled fashion. And this guy was tricky. He was a tricky airway. Um, he needed a second look with a bougie. A much smaller tube than we anticipated. It was a six tube. was the only thing that would go through this guy's vocal cords. And he remained with that size six tube for the first three weeks of his intensive care stay because nobody had the bottle to take it out. This guy did very well. He survived. You can see, obviously, he had life-changing injuries. Um, but he was alive because of a good intervention from a well-drilled team. So you are faced with strange scenes sometimes, and with bikes it's odd. If you crash your car, you can pretty much predict what energy has been transmitted. Um, if the car is badly damaged, good chance the patient is. Not the same with bikes. So you have to treat the injuries you find and also what you expect to find. So this is an accident scene. This is the first corner of a race. Uh, we were sat at the back of the grid watching a chap as he pushed the bike out of the, out of the paddock, and he was in a, a state of tremendous anxiety because um, the race had been called and he wasn't ready. He was still adjusting his brake lever as he got onto the start-finish straight. Never a good sign. So this guy was still working on his brakes as he was about to set off, and you could see eventually he reached a certain st stage, and the bikes were setting off, and he just went, ah, fuck it, it'll be fine. <laughs> and off he went. So this was the first corner. <laughs> and he arrived at this, he pulled the front brake lever, and it made a slightly funny noise, and nothing else happened. So he crashed. So this is what we were faced with. So we hopped over the fence and found the bike. Very important part of pre-hospital medicine is the concept of triage. If you have more patients than you can deal with, you have to assess who's salvageable. And we made a quick call on the garden gnomes down here in the bottom right-hand side of the screen. And you can, you can see they've just been flattened completely, so no hope. Uh, we had a quick look at the bike. You can see the forks have been ripped out of it. The wheel's gone, so we know that the motorcycle has had a significant bang. Um, fortunately, some keen environmentalist had dropped the petrol tank into a bucket for us, which is good. Uh, the next clue that we found was a divot in the ground, and that divot is suspiciously person-shaped, so we know... We knew that this guy had gone in and had hit it like a bouncing bomb and just skipped over. So we still hadn't come across the patient by this stage, but we're starting to build in our mind, you know, what this guy's going to be like. In fact, he was fine. Um, his only complaint was of a painful right ankle, and you'll have to excuse the spinal board. This was back in the day. Um, so we packaged him as we as we did as was our want at the time, and we had a look at this guy's ankle, and it was quite bad. He had an obvious fracture dislocation, oh, and his oh, sorry, and his toes were going a bit white. So we don't only deal with just the big life-threatening uh, life, um, complications, we also deal with life-changing complications like ischemic feet. So with a good performing team, we can do um, sedation, analgesia, and reduction of these things, and this was a ketamine sedation. Now, if you look closely, you can see that the ketamine syringe has ended up in this marshal's mouth here. Because uh, sometimes you don't always have a clean environment to set your equipment down, and our Dr. Fred decided that the cleanest environment was just to pop it into that guy's mouth there. And you, you can see that ketamine is quite clearly a dissociative anaesthetic because all the pain has moved into the marshal's face, if you look here closely. So. <laughs> so types of crashes, there's a few different ways to crash a motorbike. The commonest one, and you'll see this if you're a pre-hospitalist, is someone arrives at a corner and they just give up. They think they're going too fast and they run out of road and they hit usually an oncoming vehicle is the most severe one. If you're going to have a crash all on your own, uh, you can do it two different ways. You can either lose traction from the front tire so you're right going around a corner, the front tire loses grip, and the bike just falls over, and you slide and crash. Very pleasant way to crash if it's not your own bike. Um, you just sort of slide to a stop. The other way, though, is a high side. Um, <laughs> this is not so comfortable if you've ever done it. This is where the rear wheel loses traction, so the bike sort of spins out. It'll eventually grip, and it'll launch the person into the air. Uh, this is a rider called Jamie Whittam. If you've read Jamie's or, or, sorry, autobiography, this is one of two occasions in his racing career when he shot himself. Uh, so... <laughs> This was quite unpleasant for him. Um, but you can see if you get information from an ambulance crew that someone's had a high side crash, it's a, it's a fall from height, and this can be 130 miles an hour. So it's essentially like climbing out the roof of your car, out the windscreen, and jumping off. So it's not a very pleasant way to crash. The other unique aspect of bikes is that there is a potential for you to be run over by your own vehicle once you've fallen off it, or someone else. Uh, this is a 250 championship. This is um, Andrew Courtney and Davey Morgan. And Andrew Courtney fell off, Davey Morgan ran him over. Uh, both riders were fine. On t <laughs> Apart from Andrew Courtney's boxing fracture, which he's, it's he developed in this sort of post-race analysis here. Um, so, 
A top tip would be don't punch someone with a motorcycle helmet on. So. <laughs> So this is another example of someone running over themselves. This is Cameron Donald, and if you look at the second picture, you might be able to appreciate that his front tire is slightly turned, so he's lost traction, um, and he fell off. Now this should have been a pleasant crash, nice little low side crash, because he's only really got six inches to fall, and in theory he should slide to a stop. But Cameron's bike had other ideas, and it chased him, and it clipped him in the back of the head and pushed him across the circuit into the straw bales. So he had a fairly significant uh, thoracic spinal fracture simply because of a simple accident. The bike chased him and hit him. You can get run over by other people as well. This is me yet again. Um, this is me racing some supermoto in the off season. And I thought I was quite the chap here until a few corners later um, when I fell off and uh, got ran over by my own bike and then by someone else. <laughs> so, uh, this is an interesting slide. Actually, I've had two crashes racing supermoto, and this same guy has ridden over me on both occasions. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to go through four mechanisms of concern, because I've tried to keep this concise, I don't want to wrap it on too long. So four mechanisms of concern, if you're a pre-hospitalist or if you're a receiving physician in the emergency department, four things that should alert you uh, as areas of concern. He hit the curb, he's got broken feet, but is unexpl unexplicably unconscious. There was a boot that's come off, or he's had a head-on collision and apparently isolated femur fracture. So first, hit the curb. If you're sliding along on your back, an 18-inch high curb might as, well, or might as well be a 10-foot high brick wall. So if a rider has hit a curb, one of two things will happen. They'll either stop dead or they'll launch off that curb and go flying through the air. This is someone hitting a curb and stopping dead and then getting ridden over. So this is a compound injury. So although this chap was quite well, the photographer that took these photos rushed up to us and said, you want to see this? Because you can see the amount of rotation he's had on his head when he's hit that, and then someone's ridden over him. So we, we were careful with this guy. We packaged him appropriately. The other thing you can do is use it as a launch pad. This is Steve Plater at the Northwest 200. Steve hit the curb and launched himself through the air, so uh, he didn't come to a dead stop. He had a big fall from height because he hit the curb. Steve was also fine. He had a few fractures that needed attended to, uh, but he was grand afterwards, you can see. A couple of fractures, cervical spinal injury, chicken feed for a, for a racer. Helmets. <clears throat> <laughs> this, is, this is one of my favorite slides because this guy actually has a helmet. It's, it's down there in the front of his bike, but he's too cool for that. <laughs> Helmets have made an enormous difference in reducing injuries. This is a great example of it. Uh, this is a chap called James McCann who crashed at Kells. Now, even if you're not interested in motorcycle sport, you can probably tell he's gone in too fast to this corner, and he's not making it. So he had a crash, and he took out, sorry, he took out this rider called James McCann on his way, where old James didn't know what hit him. Now, James slid along. And he's sliding towards what looks like a suspiciously soft, grassy bank there. But things sometimes aren't always what they seem. James hit this with his head. Uh, this is about 130 miles an hour, by the way. And you can see this is actually a stone wall. So if you look very carefully, he's ripped out the first stone with his head there. Um, and he's proceeded to slide up the road with lots of stones following him. So if you look, you can see the sort of stones that have been ripped out of that wall with James's head. If you also look along the grass verge, you can see James up and walking about. So there he is there. Uh, and the reason he's up and walking about is because he's looking for his bike to get back onto it. <laughs> so, mechanism of injury sometimes is unreflective. Whenever it's describing, people say, you know, he slid along, hit a stone wall, and you think, mm, he looks suspiciously good. Now, helmets also come into their own if there's a bit of wildlife about. Um, this happens quite a lot at Phillip Island in Australia. It also happens in the Isle of Man TT, um, where you can collect all sorts of wildlife. This is 180 miles an hour. This is coming down to the top of Bray Hill. A seagull to the forehead at 180 miles an hour, I can assure you, hurts. Uh, so helmets are quite good at protecting against the unexpected. His helmet came off. This is something that we used to hear a bit. The old style helmets are quite poor um, sort of central bits in them, so sometimes they would rip the center of the helmet out, and the helmet would come off and the lining would stay on the head. We don't see it so much anymore. Uh, this is one that we did have recently, though. You can see the scene of the accident is farther back up the road, and the white object in the middle of the slide is the guy's helmet. This chap crashed at about 135 miles an hour at the same place that I showed earlier on, um, Cooley Hill and his helmet came off as part of the accident. His helmet came off because he got hit by the bike, and it split the helmet. You can see it sort of bullseyed and crosshaired the helmet, and it ripped it right off his head. This guy um, was another shining example of how a well-functioning pre-hospital team can change lives, because this guy was GCS3, blown pupil, unconscious, snoring, face down, helmet lying further up the road. Um, he had a rapid sequence induction, neuroprotective ventilation, thoracostomies, pelvic binder, transferred to a neurosurgical center, um, where he had a dreadful head injury. Um, but he got out of hospital just in time for the birth of his baby daughter. Um, so you can actually change lives with a high-performing team. 
If you're examining a helmet, be very careful with your assumptions. These things are designed to be a crumple zone, so sometimes the helmet can look dreadful and the patient will be fine. Sometimes the helmet can look fine and the patient will be dreadful. So we do look at helmets, we do examine them, but we don't draw too many conclusions from them. Now, if you want a good example of a high-functioning team, this is probably as good a slide as any. Uh, this is a sort of three, three or four consultants working on a trauma patient. Uh, the chap at the airway is a GP. The chap doing the thoracostomies is me, that's an anaesthetist. We have a cardiologist putting on a pelvic binder and oversight by a general practitioner. So if you've got a good functioning team, any member of it should be able to do most roles. Broken feet, reduced level of consciousness. This is one that caught us out a couple of times in the early days. If someone has slid along at a significant speed and have hit something feet first, it's like a fall from height. So you'll get the occasional typical calcaneal fractures in someone that's unconscious. Um, so if someone has broken feet and are a bit obtunded, think intracerebral hemorrhage or base of skull or high spinal. Okay, helmet removal. Helmet removal is safe. I just wanted to put a couple of slides in here. Um, use two hands, two people. Take the helmet off. We do this about 200 times a year. We've had no secondary neurological sequelae. We've done about 2,000 over the last 10 years. Taking helmets off is fine. It's safe. Occasionally you need a plan B though. Um, we've had a couple of helmets, or I've seen some in hospital practice, where a rider has crashed on the public roads and have lain for a while before they've been found, and they come in with their head swollen into their helmets, and you can't physically get it off. So our strategy for this, if you've got very little space in there, sometimes the helmet simply won't come off, um, is, sorry, use the old jiggly saw. So if you do have a helmet that's stuck and simply will not come off, you can destabilize it, provide a route for oxygenation and ventilation, and then take it off in a controlled fashion. So if you use a jiggly saw, destabilize it, and just remove the entire front of it, you'll get good access to the airway, and you can then proceed in a controlled fashion. Uh, so, if you're, so you can get right out the face. Now this is not a plan A, this is a plan B. It's extremely rare for this ever to happen. Um, just take the helmet off would be my advice. Uh, if you're a little bit worried about getting a jiggly saw in by someone's face, cut an ET tube and push that in first and that will give you a little conduit to put your jiggly saw down through, and then you can take the faceplate off. So very rare, but a bit novel. Now speed humps, these are a curse. Speed humps are a device that are there to allow a rider to be more aerodynamic on the bike, so it allows the airflow over the motorcycle um, to be quite smooth. They have no relationship to safety whatsoever. What they do do is render someone in an unintubatable position if they're flat on their back. So this is a rider lying flat on his back with a speed hump in, and you can see from the position his neck is in, he is unintubatable. His C-spine is not safe, and you will not be able to intubate this man. So it's the opposite of this position, really. So if you encounter someone with a speed hump, take it out. It's very simple to do. Um, if you just run a knife down the outside and cut the leather, the hump comes out. You can also then spin it round and use it as a little pad for the back of the head to elevate them into a neutral position. So we do this as almost the first thing we do when we encounter a rider, cut the hump out and take it out of the, out of the equation. Right, last case, I think this is head-on collision, apparently isolated femur. It's virtually impossible on a road bike to hit something head-on and just break a femur because you always rotate around the tank. So the tank will hit the femur, and the femur will open. So if you've got an isolated femur, be highly suspicious of a pelvic injury. Always put a binder on these guys if they're in any way sketchy. This is one of my best mates. This is a guy called Herbie Ronan. Again, if you're not a motorcycling enthusiast, you can probably recognize that Herbie's not making this corner. <laughs> he blames this chap on the yellow bike exclusively for this accident, and the guy on the yellow bike was nowhere near him. Um, but Herbie didn't have a good day. This is another suspiciously soft-looking hedge. And again, it's another suspiciously soft-looking hedge with a stone wall behind it. So Herbie went sliding up the road, and Herbie got his foot stuck in the hedge, and that opened his pelvis, big style. Um, so Herbie's boot got tore off. You can probably see, him following, see it following him up the road. Big pelvic splay injury. There's the boot following him. And Herbie slid to a halt up the road and came to a rest. And this is not a great situation to come around and find your best mate head down, fractured pelvis, no boot, broken arm, not in good shape at all. Um, so Herbie, we, we had a fair idea his pelvis was broken from the mechanism and from the fact that Herbie said to us, fuck, my pelvis is broken. <laughs> so <coughs> so the, <laughs> there were two very strong diagnostic clues in that picture. Uh, this is Herbie's x-ray. Not good. Uh, I'm pleased to say Herbie's now fine again. Uh, this, is him. <laughs> this is him in his element with an ice cream. Loving it. So... Uh, so Herbie's now back racing again um, after a fairly protracted stay in hospital. So beware the boot lying in the road. Um, so for some reason, if you're about to have a crash in a motorbike, your brain reverts back to when you were eight years old riding a BMX and you try and put your foot down. I have no idea why this is, but everyone does it. This is a world champion. It's about to make a fairly sketchy overtake and he's panicked a little bit. He's put his foot down. If you put your foot on the ground at 180 miles an hour, your foot will point backwards within about half a second. 
So the only way for a motorcycle boot to get torn off, if it's appropriately fastened and fitting, is for the foot to face backwards, and that's the only way the boot can come off. So if you find a boot in the middle of the road, it means that that leg has faced backwards. And the only way for that leg to face backwards at 100 miles an hour is for the foot to rotate, the tib and fib to break, the femur to break, and probably the pelvis as well. So if you find a boot has come off, be very suspicious. This is what it looks like. Um, the first picture wasn't captured by the photographer, uh, but if you look there, you can see a boot flying through the air. So if you have a look high up in the slide, there's a boot. So the rider that's just out of shot was coming down the start finish, and the chap on the yellow bike panicked him a little bit. So he put his foot down, and as soon as he did that, his leg went through a couple of hundred degrees of rotation and tore his boot off, broke his leg, and he fell off the bike. Now, there's a couple of things to notice from this sequence of slides. The first thing I want you to keep your eye on is the guy sliding up the road with no boot on. So you can see him there with no boot on. And the other thing is the marshal behind this pole, because this man is like a ninja. He's unbelievable. So this bike is coming at him at probably about 130 miles an hour or so, and it's flying through the air. There it is, about six feet away from him at head height. And again, have a look at the chap sliding up the road with no boot on. So the bike's coming at him again. It's about three feet away from his head now, and he's, cas <laughs> he's casually taking his hands out of his pockets and preparing, to <laughs> and preparing to mosey out of the way in a controlled fashion. So the next slide we see is he's had to be sit down. <laughs> and the bike has hit the telegraph pole just behind him. And again, you can see our chap sliding up the road here in the foreground. Um, and the back, bike bounced off. And you can see this marshal just bounces straight back up onto his feet again as if nothing has happened. So it was really quite impressive. And he put his flag out then at that stage. <laughs> so... <clears throat> So you can see our rider, um, when we arrived to him, he had no, um, no obvious complaints apart from the fact that his leg was sore and you could be fooled into thinking this is an isolated ankle fracture. But if the boot has come off, there has been devastation has gone on in that leg and we've had a series of these now. Limb injuries are quite prevalent in our sport. So you can see this is a significant degloving injury. I like this slide for a couple of reasons because there's, uh, the first responders on team are a consultant anaesthetist, senior paramedic um, and another couple of paramedics and not one of them is looking at the degloved foot. They're going through their structured approach, ABC, CABC, whichever you prefer. Um, and they've given, the, they've given the obvious injury a damn good ignoring. And we have a cohort of these guys now that are racing. And um, this is Robert McCrum. If you look very carefully, you'll see Robert has a false leg on. This is Robert's walking leg. This is Robert's racing leg. So he's got two different legs. The walking leg stays back in the paddock, and the racing leg goes on when he goes out on the bike. This is Robert McCrum with his walking leg on, sitting in the paddock. Road racers are tremendous at ignoring risk. This is the first time that Robert was back on the bike after his blown knee amputation. And you can see he's quite pleased that he's back out on the motorcycle again. But Robert is tremendous at ignoring risk. If you look closely in this photo, you'll see, first, first of all, he's sitting on 40 litres of aviation fuel. <laughs> and secondly, he's smoking a roll-up. So... <laughs> That's pretty hardcore. So uh, this is Robert, the first time he was back out. He won the senior, champion, the senior uh, classic championship in the roads. And this is him and Dean Cooper, who was the chap you saw on the other slide with his foot glove, both back racing. So four, me four mechanisms of concern. If you hear these, be aware. Be aware. He hit the curb, uh, or the person has broken feet, but they're suspiciously unconscious. There was a boot lying in the middle of the road, or it was a head-on collision and apparently an isolated femur. And last couple of slides, I just wanted to do a couple, if I'm okay for time. So spectators. Spectators are our biggest pain in the ass. The racers are fine. Spectators are a nightmare, bloody spectators as we call them. Because if you think road racers are good at ignoring risk, spectators are in another league altogether. This is one chap, for example, <laughs> that, uh, that was watching the races at the Northwest 200. And this guy, uh, this slide's quite impressive. This slide's even better when you see where he is. This guy made, because every time we came round in a lap, this guy was swaying slightly more in the tree. Because uh, between each race, he would scuttle down like a monkey and bring another six pack up with him back on <laughs> the top of the tree. So. This is another great example of a spectator. Um, this chap we got called to at the Northwest 200. This guy was watching the races, um, had a feed of drink, needed to go for a piss, couldn't find anywhere. Thought that cliff edge looks like the very spot. <laughs> so this chap sort of rambled up the cliff edge and he was having a pee off the edge of it, as you do. And he got caught, caught by an unexpected gust of wind and <laughs> over he went. Uh, this is over 100 feet of a drop. We know that because we couldn't winch him out with a helicopter. We had to do a ground winch. Um, this is a great human factor slide as well. This guy was very badly injured, um, closed head injury, GCS of six, uh, obvious humerus, pelvis, femur. Um, he did a big, big smack, so he got intubated, and then we had to get him out. Great human factors, human factors slide, because this is me here. Um, we don't train for winch retrievals, because there's only one cliff in Northern Ireland, and this is it. <laughs> this chap fell off it, so it wasn't something that we had really prepared for. Um, so if you look from left to right, you'll see a hard hat, hard hat, hard hat, woolly hat. And if you look from left to right, you'll see safety harness, safety harness, safety harness. And see if you can spot my safety harness in this picture. There it is down there, at the bottom of the cliff. 
Um, so I was about 80 feet up when I realized I didn't have my harness on, and I can tell you I had a Kung Fu death grip on that. <laughs> uh, so this guy got winched up, did very well. Um, we flew him to, again, the most appropriate hospital with appropriate anesthesia, and, and uh, he did very well. And he actually released a press release and said, I'd like to thank all the staff at the Royal Victoria Hospital who helped me in intensive care, the surgeons, the nursing staff. So one of our paramedics said afterwards, you know, that's gratitude for you. How does he think he got there? And Sam was fucking sorry. So. <laughs> So, <clears throat> so sometimes your, your input is unappreciated, uh, but that's not why we do it. We do it for this reason. Um, so I think that's me out of time, so I think I'll stop there. So thank you very much. Wow, well, that was an awesome talk. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions uh, to put to this man who's clearly seen it all over here? Um, practice. Um, I mean, we, we do the way that we run this. Usually, we do the first lap of each race, the warm up lap and the last lap, um, and that allows us a bit of oversight. So we do the first lap, last lap, and warm up lap for a few reasons. So if an incident's going to happen, it'll usually be on one of those three. Uh, when you have a pack heading out together on cold tires, full fuel loads, and it means that we have oversight as well. So if something has happened on the last lap of a race and has been lost in radio traffic, we can still pick it up, and it allows us to keep a little bit of temperature in the tires, so just enough to go. Yeah, we do. It's one of the reasons we put such a strong perspective in the scene, because sometimes we will get to them, and they're so soon after their incident. And these guys are operating up to or close to their lactate threshold. This has been quite well studied in professional motorcyclists. They're, they're like any other athlete, they're at their lactate threshold. So all of them are sweaty, all of them are tachycardic, all of them look dreadful. Um, some of them are altered uh, because they're very agitated, they want up, you know, they've just crashed out of a race. Um, so you sometimes have to take a little period of time just to let the dust settle and allow them to declare themselves and be cognizant of what's just <laughs> happened to them. So if we see some of the scenes that we've seen where the rider's been fine, uh, we give them a couple of minutes to declare themselves. And the flip side's true as well, and there's been some uh, talks done recently, you know, Gareth Davies has talked about impact brain apnea, and we see that a lot. We see lots of guys that you get to them and they look dead, you know, they're, they're agonal breathing, they're blue or black, you take the helmet off, you do simple manoeuvres, provide oxygen while you're setting up for an RSI, and by the time you've set up your kit dump, they're awake, and they're saying, you know, what, what happened, where's the bike, what position am I in, did I win? This sort of thing. So, uh, so we see that a lot. We see maybe four or five of those a year, and it's just a, a sort of reflection on this, this, this sort of how quickly we're on scene, um, because we have the luxury of being beside these guys often when they crash. But we do see that a lot. We're simple airway manoeuvres, and these guys are back on their feet within a few minutes. Apart from helmets and speed humps, are the leathers and other Yes, they are. I have lots of slides in this as well, but just time was of the essence. So the, the leathers are becoming more and more um, elaborate. Before it was just leather. Uh, now you've got kangaroo skin. Um, there's ray skin on some of the abrasion areas. And there's areas of titanium. The zips are reinforced with Kevlar. Uh, so you have to have a structured approach to cutting leathers. If you just go at it with a pair of tough cuts and try and cut through ray skin, you have no chance. Um, so you have to take a moment and actually, it's nearly like planning an extrication from a vehicle. You have to look at the person's leathers and decide where are the seams, where are the stretch panels, where's the reinforced areas, how am I going to cut this so that it doesn't turn into a butchery session. And ideally you want the leathers to come off and look a bit like a bearskin rug afterwards. So there's only a couple of cuts and the whole thing folds away. But you do, it does take a bit of forward planning to come up with a strategy for each different set of leathers. Each manufacturer will be slightly different. Yeah, quad bikes I think pound per pound are the most dangerous vehicle in the entire world. So. <laughs> That's why I only have two of them. Uh, <laughs> uh, the quad bikes are, are a funny beast because it's quite difficult to be ejected from a quad bike without it rolling over you. And that's the classic quad bike injury is a rollover injury um, where someone's flipped it and the bike has, has pirouetted over the top of them. Uh, so they seem to be tremendously unforgiving. So I would say um, be aware that these patients can have contiguous injuries in different body systems. Um, and that seems to be the, our findings from quad bikes is that you, you rarely have an isolated injury the only way really to break your tib and fib with a quad bike is for it to have rolled over the whole body. So be aware, and like any trauma patient, you know, expect the unexpected with them. Now, a few of us have carried like a pre-hospital kit, which you're yeah. obviously carrying there, and it's phenomenally heavy. It's pretty awkward. And you're racing motorbikes. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of work has gone into this kit. Um, we've gone through a few phases. We tried Thomas packs. Um, which was impossible. You know, after three weeks or three days at the Northwest 200, you just you can't carry them anymore. So this system is an Emergo system. It's Swedish, um, and it's four pouches that sit at waist level. So when you're sat on the bike, there's very little load on you, and it keeps the centre of gravity in the middle, so it doesn't really affect riding. 
um, and the backpack we try and keep the weight as low as possible in it. Uh, so we still carry about 20, 25 kilos worth of kit, but it's spread quite nice and evenly. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work goes in to try and keep ourselves reasonably fit for the start of the racing season because this is hard work. This is really hard work. Um, and it's difficult jumping out of a helicopter to treat someone. It's even more difficult if you have to ride nine miles flat out on cold tires, um, upwards of 180 miles an hour at times, and then jump off and then run into a field and then treat the patient. So there's, uh, we have to, the equipment has to be right and yourself has to be right. And pre-hospital medicine is probably one of the only fields in medicine where your health can actually have an, an impact on the patient's outcome. So we think very carefully about how we package the kit and uh, we keep ourselves in reasonable nicks so that we can do the job. Yeah. We control it tightly. I mean, the systems that we run are very, very robust. And um, there's radio communication from every flag point around the circuit and in between. Uh, so the, we usually set off before the race has nearly come to a stop. So if an incident happens, it's stopped by way of red flags. So the flags come out, everyone slows their racing speed down, uh, and we go live. So by the time that we reach an accident, the track is still live but controlled. Um, and then whenever we reach the accident, the bikes will start to filter back to the grid, and then the track is it's still not open. Um, but that's when you'll find that, for example, spectators start wandering out. Um, so part of our strategy is to go quickly um, as soon as an incident is declared, and then the circuit can be gradually brought down to a stop. Um, and bringing something like the Northwest 200 to a stop is very difficult. You can have 50 bikes over nine miles, all doing three-figure speeds. Um, so it has to be, it can't just be stopped. It has to be sort of brought down gradually over a minute or so. Um, so we do have quite a lot of systems in place to make it safe. Okay, one final question from anybody. Okay, back to you. How do you coordinate the preoperative treatment on the track and then the patient journey from the track to the hospital? Is that just by more staff? Uh, it depends. We, we have a number of people that would be able to, to do transfer, um, and we usually just pick the most appropriate one. Um, the method for transfer is quite difficult. Northern Ireland is the only place in Europe that doesn't have an air ambulance. Uh, we don't have a helipad at our allegedly regional trauma centre. Um, so we very often do most of our transfers by land, um, which is why the, the interventions done on scene and en route are so important. Um, so we do aim like any service to try and deliver them as optimised as we possibly can. Generally, if it's a big enough incident, all the medical staff will, will attend to it. Um, if a race is stopped, um, everyone just comes, and generally they arrive in dribs and drabs as they can. Um, so everyone's usually involved in some way, um, either infrastructure, taking care of the track, uh, you know, clearing an exit route for the ambulance. Um, so everyone's usually fairly briefed as to what's happening, and then the most appropriate person goes. Okay, 